it's Matt Roush. And Mike Brennan. And we're back with another segment of the M Squared TechCast. We have with us today a first time guest on the show, uh, but certainly we have uh, interviewed many of your predecessors through the years and uh, always been impressed with how the state runs its IT operation. It's uh, Brom Stiggitz. Did I get that right? Uh, Stibbets, Brom Stibbets. Stibbets. Okay, sorry. Okay, wrong, uh, wrong consonant. Um, <laughs> listen, why, why don't we start out with, uh, you give us a little bit of your background and sort of your career path and how you came to be in this position. Yeah, sure. Well, I've been in state government for about 15 years. Uh, I actually started out working in the legislature, uh, what mm-hmm. seemed like a long time ago. Uh, as a policy advisor, and I ended up working the uh, last couple of years there uh, for, the, for the speaker from 2008 to 2010. After that, I spent about five years in the state treasury department, um, you know, doing a number of things there, uh, working on, you know, some, uh, some IT initiatives there, as well as culture issues, things like that. And for about the last six years, then, I've been at the Department of Technology Management and Budget. And so, I was uh, the, you know, in state government speak, the uh, chief deputy director for, um, you know, until until the last, uh, say, seven months. And the chief deputy is kind of the COO for the organization. So DTMB is, you know, I'm here because we're the IT department for the state. And that's about two thirds of our employees and what we do. But we also run a number of things for the state, uh, including, you know, facilities, procurement, fleet, you know, thing, things like that. So been there. And, you know, in March, uh, early March, the governor uh, appointed me uh, CIO. And about a week later, uh, we, we tried to send about 30,000 people home to work. So trial mm-hmm. by fire, I guess, but I think maybe we'll come back to that a little bit later in the in the conversation. Yeah, let's start off with the latest news, though, for the sixth straight time. Now, I was corrected by Caleb. I thought it was six straight years, but but it's actually the surveys every other year. So essentially be 12 years. The well, Center for Digital Government has recognized Michigan with a grade of A, and you're only one of a handful of states. I think Virginia, maybe, and Maryland are in there, too. But uh, but you guys are at the top of the list. Yeah, we are. And, you know, thank you for, uh, for giving us some time to talk about this. This is something we're really proud of in Michigan. And for those folks that aren't um, involved in, let's say, public sector or, you know, aren't familiar with the kind of state government space in IT, Um, This award, this is the most comprehensive review of um, state government IT organizations that there is. And so it really means, you know, we we believe it means a lot to receive an A grade on this. Like you said, there were only five states across the nation that got an A grade this year. Um, Like you said, it's done every other year. And Michigan is only one, one of only two states to have actually gotten an A every time that they've done it, six consecutive Mm -hmm. times. Utah is the other state uh, that's, that's gotten that A six times in a row. So this is something that we're really proud of. And, you know, it's, um, look, you always like to be recognized um, for the work that you do. Um, but this survey, you know, it's, like I said, it's pretty comprehensive. So it looks at um, the things that you've done to support state priorities. Um, it looks at how, what have you done to uh, improve operations? What have you done to, um, you know, help with hard and soft dollar savings benefits? Um, you know, coming up with innovative ideas, citizen-centric services, um, how do we collaborate? And and the tough thing about the survey is, you know, as much as I can say, you you know, the the early years, that was work done by not me and, you know, a lot of, you know, teams before us. So we certainly stand on the shoulders of others. Um, But kind of the cool thing about this is you can't just rest on your laurels. You have to continue to demonstrate that you're making progress so it's not just, hey, you're still, you know, 99th percentile or whatever. Um, you, you know, you have to continue to innovate and to try and drive um, additional uh, benefits from IT um, for doing this. And so, um, you know, as we look at it, uh, what, what we heard, you know, I can tell you some of the reasons that, they, that we got the A grade. But before I tell you what the Center for Digital Government said, you know, I'm just going to give you my soapbox here for a minute since, uh, since, you're, since you're putting me on your show. And folks that know me are going to be sick of hearing this, but, you know, it comes back to the people. And I think, you know, a lot of people that have worked uh, in IT for a long time uh, know, well, you know, how many times have you rolled out a, a product that could have been a perfect IT product that did exactly what it was supposed to do? And it maybe not failed, maybe it failed, maybe it didn't do as well because of the people angle. And so we spend a lot of time and effort in DTMB. Like I say, we're a big shop, you know, we're 2000 people in IT alone. So we put a lot of effort into culture 
And how do we make sure that we have um, engaged employees? How do we make sure that we have employees who feel empowered to raise their hand and say, I think there's a better way to do this. And you know, just so that they really have that culture of being a team. And so I would say that's the underpinnings of anything that we're successful at doing is having 2000 people that are working as part of one big team, you know, and, and that they're all engaged. Now, some of the things that we were specifically recognized for this year um, included, uh, you know, we have a, we call it the Office of, of Continuous Improvement. A lot of, a lot of shops have a, you know, let's say a process improvement shop. Um, we actually have two in DTMB and we have one that's focused primarily on, um, on IT related things. So they're focused on, you know, we have a requirement that says anytime you're going to do any big upgrade or launch any new system, first you have to do a process improvement uh, an initiative around that process. So you're not repaving the cow path, as they say. Let's make sure we have an efficient process before we try to automate it or re-automate it. Um, so that's something that we've really focused on. Um, you know, another thing the state's done, and, and people might say, hey, this is kind of geeky or, or whatever, you know, this is like the privacy space is maybe kind of a niche thing and people don't, but we, um, the state's actually put a lot of effort into data and privacy. Uh, we require each of our agencies, which are, you know, the state departments kind of subunits of the state, we require them each to actually have a chief data steward. And that when we um, do any work in the IT space, we're, we're giving, you know, putting all, some effort into understanding the data classification. So that way, when we go out, we're not overbuying from a security perspective, but we're ensuring that we have the appropriate controls in place. Um, and then finally, the last thing I'll say on this is um, we were recognized for some you know, efforts around you know, human-centered design, user experience, things like that. If folks that are familiar with the, um, the new uh, Secretary of State uh, registration system that got launched, uh, recently, or the new um, Department of Natural Resources um, um, system to do hunting and fishing licenses. And so those are both examples of how can you not only build an IT application that does what it's supposed to, but it's, you know, it's actually nice for the, for the residents or, or the users to interact with. So, and that's something that we're going to continue to focus more on. Let, let me ask you, since everybody's gone to virtual because of the COVID, and I, you guys probably have a lot of state employees working from home. It looks like you are as well. What sort of risks does that pose though? I mean, everybody's, the BYOB was the big thing a few years ago, bring your own device and also bring all your viruses and other hackers with you kind of thing. Exactly. How do you protect yourself from all that? Yeah, yeah, certainly it's a big, it's a big change. Yeah, as you say, I'm coming to you here from the, uh, from the, from Brahm, the Brahms basement office of, uh, of DTMB. And that's where, you know, I'm guessing we still have roughly 30,000 uh, state employees that are doing remote work right now. So, you know, let's say that's roughly 30,000 out of 50,000. So that's a big deal. That's a big deal from an IT perspective, not only from the angle of how do you empower your employees to do that? How do you give them the tools to do it? But as you said, from the security perspective. So, you know, just to start out as we, like I said, I was appointed CIO probably about a week before um, we, we, we had to do this. Luckily for me, as I said, I've been with the team for a long time. So I had, you know, long relationships with the, uh, all the IT deputies and I've been very involved in this. But, um, you know, so in, in, in some ways we were really well positioned for this, both from an enabling remote work as well as enabling secure remote work, as you say. Um, we had switched over years ago to Office 365 and we had, and when, you know, when you, when you move to a platform like that, you have decisions that you can make around how much security do you want to do? And so we had done things like we had, you know, required MFA um, for that. You know, we certainly, uh, you know, we have a, a privacy uh, approach that is based on, you know, many conditions, some of which is this a state device that's accessing this, uh, you know, this information. So whether it's, whether it's your laptop, desktop, or whether it's a, a state uh, cell phone, or smart device, I should say. Um, so those are things that we've all done. You know, luckily we had rolled out a lot of the endpoint protections for those so that people could work from home and they could do it in a way that we felt comfortable, um, that it was still secure. You know, so certainly, you know, we, um, you know, there were other things that we had to do to ensure that it was secure. So we didn't, we, we didn't have anywhere near enough VPN licenses or tokens just because people that worked remotely 
it was like a, hey, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to do it this week or I'm going to do it on a Friday or, or something like that. And, and the vast majority of state employees were not regularly working remotely, but we knew that this was something that there was a demand for. We did have some agencies with people that primarily work remote. And so we did have the capability to do that, but certainly we had to look at that and say, all right, we're going to need to at least double um, our VPN capacity uh, if we're going to be able to support this so that people can uh, securely connect. Um, and so that was, you know, a bit of a scramble. Um, we knew, you know, we want people to be working on, as I mentioned, state owned and managed devices. We don't, as a general rule, we don't allow people to work from personal devices. Now there's, you know, periodically you can log into Office 365, let's say, um, but there was a big scramble from us to make sure that we had enough laptops. Because frankly, you know, a lot of people, if you worked in an office setting all the time, you might not have had a laptop. And so, you know, there was that scramble, how do we get laptops? How do we get the VPN set up on all these things? Um, how do we make sure that people know how to use VPN? Frankly, it's easy for us to get it and push it out. Um, but it's another thing, you know, the end user has to take some uh, initiative there and they have to actually set it up. And so we knew we had a really short timeline to do all this. And so a lot of it was, you know, a lot of it was the tech stuff. How do we make sure that it's there? How can we push it? How can we do these things? But so much of what we did was just training. Like I say, like I said in the very beginning, it comes back to the person. We put together, you know, in a week, we put together training videos. Here's how to set up your VPN. Here's how to um, do your MFA for uh, off your Office products, your Microsoft products, excuse me. Um, we even put out advice for people. How should you manage your home network? Right. That's that's our biggest concern is now people are working on their home networks and we don't control those. So certainly a VPN is a good step. Using MFA is a good step. Um, but we gave, you know, we gave state employees best practices for how you should set up your home network, things like that. I'll tell you the one real upside of of sending everyone home quickly uh, was driving adoption. You know, we certainly we, we moved everyone over to Microsoft Teams like that. You know, whereas that adoption might have taken a year otherwise to get everyone up and running. So, um, so no, we're very comfortable with where we are, and we're starting to look now at <clears throat> what does this mean in the future? What does this mean? What does this mean for our brick and mortar facilities? How many offices do we have? You know, how do we potentially use expanded remote work to be able to uh, recruit from a broader pool, et cetera? Yeah, that was. We got about two minutes left, and that was my question. I was going to ask is. Just like the previous guest, is this the new normal or is there going to be a hybrid model? You only got about a minute. I'm sorry, but uh, go ahead. What no, do you think? No, that's great. Yeah, this that's the that's the big question now, right? Because we're going to need to respond from an IT perspective. The state government's going to need to know how to respond from a building's perspective. Uh, you know, if you're asking me, again, I'm not the governor. I'm not the boss of 50,000 state employees, certainly. Um, but if you're asking me, I think that it's going to be for state government, I suspect that there's going to be kind of a hybrid model. I don't necessarily expect a big move to 100% remote, i.e. you don't have an office, but I certainly expect just if you look at the trends in the industry that if, we're, if we wanna continue to play in IT and we wanna be able to continue to recruit and retain people, um, we're gonna need to offer more flexibility and we're gonna need to figure out how to um, build and maintain teams when we have people working remotely more often. Additional four-year students love Lawrence Technological University's thriving campus life. But LTU has always met non-traditional students' needs, too. Lawrence Tech offers over 100 degree and certificate programs that can get adult students started or back on track. And most of our classes are conveniently offered evenings at our beautiful Southfield campus or online so you can balance your social, family, and work life even while you power up your career. Lawrence Tech, where blue devils dare.